All right, how's it going, everybody? Today we're going to be talking about content analysis, and this one is uh, fairly critical to your success in the course. So I hope that uh, you, you take it, you take it seriously, you pay attention. And um, you know, usually this uh, lecture would be kind of interactive, right? Like I wouldn't actually be doing much talking; it'd be really up to the class. So. Um, I'm asking that you really kind of remain critical, engage your brains, and um, don't just listen. And maybe even you pause, you kind of think about it for a minute, and then you hear what I have to say about some of these. Um, but what we do want, need to know right here are a couple definitions right off uh, the bat. But we want to know artworks communicate visual ideas through the interpretation of the visual language used, right? So the visual language is elements, principles, right? The form of the work, right? Aesthetic qualities. Um, and then content and context. These are critical, um, easily confused, um, but really important when we're looking at work. So the content is the underlying ideas, themes or meanings being communicated, all right? That's like what the artist is, you know, trying to talk about, trying to get across or, or working with. And then the context are the circumstances surrounding the creation of that work of art, including historical events, social conditions, biographical facts about the artist and the, or their intentions, right? So um, work being made right now, right, is kind of in the, the context of uh, the coronavirus, right? So those can be kind of the social conditions of the current moment. And when art historians look back at this time period, it'll be kind of that historical event that they're gonna look at a lot of the work within. Um, and social distancing, the fact that galleries are closed, all right? So that's one way to think about it. Um, a lot of really interesting work happened, um, I think it's 30, Years ago now the Berlin Wall came down um, so the, there's a lot of work that were that was you know um, similar color palettes and really influenced by um, the fact that the Berlin Wall, wall was coming down um, so hopefully you got got those um, these are these are another um, and we got some kind of uh, we want to make sure we're getting all these written down essentially um, art criticism moving forward you're going to be expected to know these steps for um, quizzes all right so uh, and test. Describe what you see. Okay? Analyze. How are the elements and principles being used? Interpret. What is the content? What is the artist trying to communicate? And then my personal favorite, evaluate. Right? How successful is the work? Um, and, you know, do you like it? Right? That's, that's kind of a fun part, too. Um, so I always really like it. Um, when uh, I shouldn't say I like it when you don't like work, but I enjoy it when you're able to kind of tell me why you don't like it or why you don't think it's successful rather than just being like, nah, no, nah, not for me. Right. Like dig in, think about why it is that you might not be into it. Right. So um, up to this point, you know, we've been doing um, just kind of a formal analysis as the way to read um, the work, you know, just looking at how the elements principles are being utilized. Um, but we need to also recognize that form influences content. And it's important to connect the aesthetic qualities and techniques being used with the conceptual aspects of the work, right? So uh, how are the elements and principles being used successfully to um, convey conceptual notions that the, that the artist is, is interested in or working with, right? Okay, so we're going to open up um, with a piece here that is... Maybe a little bit, a little bit weird to some of us, but um, in the past, students and classes have done a really amazing job reading this work, um, and that's why I continue to show it. So I just ask that you uh, press pause here for a second and look at it, think about what it might mean. All right. So hopefully you, hopefully you did that. And uh, first thing, like, what are we seeing, right? Um, so we have a couple of, of animals here, like, and, and what might they be, you know, maybe like a mule or a donkey, maybe how we would describe them. And then what's the material being used, right? We got wood, concrete, and steel. And then one thing that people, students often kind of key in on is like, now what is this, right? Um, it's like a really textured, it, the, you kind of lose it through the image, but that all the orange or uh, red-orange, however you want to refer to this color, 
um, is like almost like a shag carpet. It's really kind of textured. And a lot of times, um, we'll, we'll get to that one in just a second. So that, that's kind of what's going on there, right? He thinks about these as paintings and the, um, sometimes they're displayed on walls. But um, I want to kind of direct our attention to the material here. Like sometimes we have a hierarchy in um, pieces of, of art. Uh, in, in religious context, sometimes it's like a, a visual hierarchy where we're reading from top to bottom and bottom to top, and there's kind of like a storyline unfolding, right? Um, so we might be able to look at this in that way. Um, one of my favorite ways that I've heard uh, people read this is, we have wood, and then we have concrete, and then we have steel, right? So we kind of have a material hierarchy here in building materials, right? So first uh, we use wood, um, then it, you know the, uh, the Romans used a lot of concrete, and um, we think about steel as uh, kind of an industrial revolution, right? So we have that happening. We also have this I-beam on the backs of these mules. It's a working animal. Uh, we, we look at animals as something that kind of transformed agriculture and trade, right? So, um, and they they have their, they have the steel on the back of, on their back. And then a lot of times, you know, almost every class, this central um, kind of piece here is brought up as like blood or sweat, um, and more often blood because of the color. All right, so um, Don Moffat is, um, he's a really interesting guy. He doesn't have a lot of really clear artist statements. Um, so he, he's kind of a fun one to, to look into um, for that reason. But one of the statements regarding this body of work, uh, I pulled out of a magazine, which I thought was kind of funny. Um, but I'm wondering whether nature can still, still hold our attention. It's actually kind of boring compared to the rowdy, intense culture, the news, Trump, assault, we assault weapons. Uh, <clears throat> Miley Cyrus. I'm not so naive to think that you can go back to the land. It's too late for that. There's too many of us, not enough land. But what's left out there? Can we experience it quietly again? Still. And right, so, kind of a cryptic artist, but that's one of the things that um, why art historians kind of, or art critics find them fun. All right, moving along. Wow. Well, Lawn being sprinkled. Uh, this is a painting by David Hockney. And if we were in class, uh, again, please, you know, take a pause, take a look, see what, tell me what you're seeing, think about what you're seeing. If we were in class, uh, I would, uh, that's what I would ask. First thing, what are we seeing? All right. A lot of times people say uh, a lawn being sprinkled. Like, yeah, nailing it. What else? Uh, okay. Yeah, we have uh, sprinklers going. What about the sprinklers? They are, what are they? Are they? They're shape, simple shape, right? Really kind of hard lines. Um, the color is only in the lawn, the sky, and the shrubs, right? The palm tree and the shrubs right next to the house. Um, I like to point out that the house itself is gray, all right? And the handling of this paint is all very flat. Right. So what might that mean? Okay, so David Hockney is someone we'll, we'll see a little bit in pop art later. He's he's a from Britain. And then he moved to the United States, but he was also making work while he's in Britain about the United States. And it was kind of his view on the suburban life of how kind of drab that he felt it was. Um, and so this is kind of his representation of that. And we see that through the form, right? Through the elements and principles, the way he's handling the paint. The sprinklers themselves are, no sprinkler is going to be have like a 90 degree, right? Water is something that's inherently fluid. Yet we have a very like hard line here, right? But it's kind of speaking to the order of the law of watering the lawn, right? Um, the house itself is gray. Okay, so um, I think that we can talk about color um, in, in the way that he's kind of thinking about this place um, and as a successful um, kind of marriage of form and, and content, right? Um, this is also kind of coming, it's like post-war. So the 
the suburban life is really um, thriving in the United States. And this is a kind of a hot topic. So we can think about that in terms of historical context as well. Right? But then it's still up to you to say whether or not you think it's good or not. Right? We always remember that. All right, Diego Romero is a ceramicist. He's currently living in Santa Fe and uh, he's half raised in a reservation, half raised in LA. Um, and he thought, he always felt like this uh, kind of split identity. Um, and he, he found uh, a lot of like personal enjoyment and growth in comic books and video games as a child. It wasn't until he was um, kind of late teen years that he started um, actually learning um, the traditional uh, ceramic methods of his culture. And uh, so this is a bowl here, right? And a ceramic bowl on terracotta. You can see the clay body come through just a little bit right there, kind of along the rim, right? It's kind of really beautiful red clay that's mined, um, New Mexico and Arizona. But uh, so he, he did a really kind of beautiful thing where he's combining the ancestral techniques of his, um, of his uh, people and kind of contemporary imagery of his um, life and our, our peers essentially, right? So simply we, we're seeing line and shape here, right? We got really strong contrast. We kind of think about elements and principles that way. Um, but then, you know, what, what might be going on here, right? Also, the um, handling, it's, it's very comic, right? Um, but it's also the technique of um, Native American pottery. So it, it kind of has a nice uh, kind of marriage there, right? It's a contemporary language. Um, <clears throat> but we have a nice sharp line right kind of illuminating the figure and this is what's well, kind of said to be a self-portrait all right and then below the ground this is kind of critical area right so it's it's kind of hinting at his history right there's that form down here is like a vessel it's like a little ceramic pot right and it kind of shows him playing video games over the top of um his past, right? His ancestral past. So that's just something to think about and um, kind of find find your personal metaphors there. Right. Andy Warhol, all right, another pop artist. Uh, I've shown a couple pop artists here because we're moving into abstract expressionism and pop art, so it's kind of foreshadowing a little bit. Um, but something interesting about Andy Warhol is he actually won a portrait drawing contest of Marilyn Monroe. All right, but in his work, he purposely uses um, kind of a pop image of her, right? So this is the last image that she approved before she, um, she died. Uh, um, and if you don't know, she died of an overdose and he, uh, takes it from newspaper, prints it in black and white, and then prints these colors over the top. And they're, you know, they're almost like not well done, right? But that's also kind of the point, okay? So just a little context there. <clears throat> what are we seeing? So we got um, sharp contrast from, from left to right, right to left, and the color to the black and white. Um, if we're going to zoom in on maybe just the left side, we have the super kind of saturated hair and eyeliner, the lipstick printed over, um, over the, the black lips so from the black and white print. And it's all just really overdone. It's kind of like that glamour, right, that uh, celebrities have. And on the right side, it's, uh, you know, she's kind of fading away, right? So what you know, I ask you, what is that metaphor there? All right, so it's kind of her, her rise to fame and then her fading away into her eventual overdose. And then you, I also don't want us to lose fact, uh, lose sight that um, we have 
her repeated over and over again, we can think about that just as simply as shape, right? Shape and repetition and balance and contrast. So just, uh, I'm confident you can pull a couple more out of there too, in terms of kind of formal elements there. Uh, and I just want to give you a little uh, close up. He did a ton of these. So, Mary Iverson, uh, this is a piece that we haven't gotten into the history of landscape yet. Um, so, I think I'm actually going to save this one. But uh, I'll just say, like, history of landscape painting in the West um, is pretty significant. And uh, what's interesting about her work, though, is she's got all these right, cubic form, uh, cubic shapes, rather, in the foreground with the perspective lines going off into the distance. And she thinks about these kind of um, abstract shapes in her compositions as uh, like shipping containers and the lines as metaphors for um, the places that are shipping effects right the unseen influences and kind of by painting them over these kind of classic landscapes um, as a metaphor for our um, influence on the natural world um, so I'll let you kind of noodle on what that means to you Cinta Vidal uh, I showed her briefly in, a, in a perspective um, in a space lecture um, but just a little reminder that uh, she's really interested in how we all share the same spaces but view them in vastly different ways. Right. So style, uh, the handling of distinctive elements and particular media throughout the various artistic periods associated with the work of an individual artist like Van Gogh, the school of movement like Impressionism or Surrealism, or a specific culture and time period. Um, if we were going to be writing an essay in this class, or if you needed um, or wanted to do some extra credit, right, um, and just love writing essays, this would be a way that you could go about comparing and contrasting uh, works, right? So, uh, just kind of to, to continue on that, it's a, one of the best ways to illustrate stylistic differences is to examine a group of artworks within a common theme and then kind of compare and contrast them, right? Um, the works of most artists is a product of their culture and time. So we want to really be sensitive to the context of the time period, right? And I'm just going to kind of flash through uh, some photo or some artworks rather of couples through time, right? And how we can see how they're a product of time and culture, okay? Vari uh, variations in style can be linked to uh, different media, definitely, diverse cultural conte uh, contexts and characteristic approaches of the artists uh, to the subject, right? I mean, how can you not love this one? Another uh, pop art foreshadowing. Okay. And Robert Mablethorpe, so we'll look at um, in the art, kind of art and gender and art and body time. And uh, I think I'm going to kind of breeze over these ones just because I think that this, it does so much more when we're kind of all in person and talking about these. And I can really hear what you all think, but I'll just give you a little background on what we're looking at um, on the left here. We have uh, some pigment, it's a painting, um, that this artist collects from uh, mining runoff. So it's essentially contaminated water that he pulls and then lets uh, all the minerals settle, um, pulls the water off the top and then creates these pigments. Um, but it's kind of really beautiful comparison when you're looking at this aerial photography from the mining project. Um, both of these, you know, artists are, they are uh, interested and concerned with, you know, environmental impacts, but they also look at these as really aesthetic um, kind of compositions themselves, right? Kind of the beauty in, in something that, um, that you could say is, is not a beautiful process, right? but maybe has potential to be. 
So this would be a good compare and contrast example if you needed to write a, a paper on uh, contemporary artists kind of working with the same theme. And I just isolated each one just for a second. And you can also maybe think about doing it with a, a labyrinth of plastic waste, right? It's both kind of environmentally um, concerned artists. I encourage you to take a look at this one if you're interested in this, this work, this style of work. Here's a little detail here. I do want to just do an artist spotlight because we've talked about Ulfer Elias a couple of times this semester already, but I haven't really given him, um, you know, I haven't done him justice, I guess. So I just would like to uh, watch a quick video. Uh, no one does it better than the artists themselves. So without further ado. Sometimes art is capable of verbalizing on your behalf a feeling that you might carry with you. Could also be a traumatic thing or a positive memory. Everyone sees something different because the artwork hosts whatever subjective matter you bring to the artwork. I recognize that this is not always the case and some people might you know, feel that the art world is elitist and not very good at listening and, and that's a very valid argument as well. The great strength of not just art but culture is this ability to be inclusive and to essentially reflect people's emotional need. I didn't really intend it, but this is a very circular show. The title of the show is The Listening Dimension. It's constructed realities playing with the idea of an optical illusion. And if you are uncertain, you are always welcome to look behind. The abstraction allows for you to find out for yourself. And I find that very generous and also very trust generating. When I was at art school, I discovered the so-called light and space movement out of California. It was James Terrell and Robert Irvin and people who introduced a set of spatial experiments, which were very much focused on reconsidering the role of the viewer or the person engaged in art. And for me, that had to do with trust, that I was given the opportunity to actually have some responsibility. Yeah, but sure, this will need a stronger one as well. Somebody telling you, I trust you. You can look at this, do something with it, and make something that makes sense to you. It's actually one of the great things about art. It's time, then it's light, right? You know, 12 months. And then there is this. My father was a painter and he would travel into the mountains and I would sort of talk along. While he was making art, I would just climb and hug around and make small dams in the rivers. And that gave me a relatively relaxed, but also a very tangible relationship with what type of environment the Icelandic landscape offered. The Icelandic landscape has no trees, no cars, no cows. So it's kind of looking like the moon. You wonder, am I looking at a space which is one hour, one day, or one week deep? If 
once you start walking, you realize that stone is actually not so far away. It encourages you to become your own navigator. If you are active, it will change. If you're passive, it will be out of reach. Everybody has a relationship with natural phenomena. You don't have to be a professional to have an opinion about a rainbow. I've been quite busy in my artworks saying, well, it's not about me growing up in nature. It's really about you and what you can make of it. It's great to be in a situation where you feel that on a deep level, the surroundings reflect your emotional need. Because then you say, I am needed. <laughs>